Right. Welcome to the Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect, the state-of-the-art co-working space and tech labs help, helps to grow innovative ideas from applied research and development, testing, and engineering qualification to communicate to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker is Blair Kaplan Venables. Blair is a communications expert based in Pemberton, British Columbia. She is president of Blair Kaplan Communications, director of business development for Alpine Writing and board member for the Pemberton Chamber of Commerce. Blair recently launched the I Am Resilient project, is working on writing her first book and is a national speaker. Vancouver Business Network and most welcome guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and welcome Blair Kaplan Venables to the stage. Hello, just in my mark here. Hi, so I'm Blair, Blair Kaplan Venables, and I'm here to help inspire you to live a more positive life by harnessing the power of resilience. This is gonna be about an hour talk. It's gonna be a conversation. I'm gonna share with you my story. I'm gonna share with you tips, scientifically proven tips, things that have worked with me. But I want you all to engage. I want you all to ask questions. If you're watching this later, throw it in the comments section. What we are doing is we're building a community of resilient humans, because that's what we are. We're all resilient. You are resilient. So after this session, after watching this video or sitting here in this room, um, you're going to be able to take a look at your life and reevaluate if you're on the right path. Maybe you're going to want to mend personal and professional relationships or work on the ones that you already have. Um, and you might want to focus on enhancing the things that bring you joy to life. We all do things in life that don't bring us joy. And that's not a scientifically proven fact, it's a human fact. A little bit of a flow we're going to go through. We're going to talk about the definition of resilient. Uh, I'm going to tell you about who I am in my story, and it's a tough one. And it's um, a really detailed personal story. We're going to talk about how to build resilience. I'm going to talk about the I Am Resilient Project, especially because I know you're all dying to know what it is, right? Yeah. And we're going to go through just a few resources. There are so many resources out there, but we're going to review specific resources that are things you can go home tonight and go down the Google vortex on while lying in bed because you're up at night thinking about all the things you want to do. So just as a trigger warning, I'm not a therapist. I'm a professional human. I'm going to be sharing with you my story and some of the things that you're going to be hearing may trigger you. It's okay to feel those feelings, but if you need to stop the video, pause the video, get up and leave the room, that's okay. It's okay to not be okay, and if you start to feel some feelings, please take a minute, take a break. If you need additional support for resources, um, we can help you out with that. So I just wanna make sure everyone's really comfortable with that. So let's define resilient. Resilient, it's able to withstand or recover quickly from a difficult condition. Does anyone have any questions about the word resilient or would like to add a comment in? All right, so before I go on, I'm gonna reiterate what I just said. It's the able to, you're able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. We are all humans. We are all resilient. And I know this because we got here tonight. We're living, breathing creatures who have feelings. We bounce back from whatever life has thrown us. You are all resilient. So, I'm going to talk about my story. And this is where I may trigger you. Um, so I just want to let you know I'm not offended if you need to leave the room or leave your desk or phone or wherever you are out there. Um, this is a picture actually of uh, me and my father. Um, that's my dad, Leonard Kaplan. And this is um, on Father's Day weekend in Manitoba. We were guests on CBC Radio. So come on in. So my name is Blair Kaplan Venables, born in Winnipeg in the 80s. 
first daughter to my parents, into a Jewish family. I went to private school. I got to do a lot of really cool things. And one of the things that I got to experience was my parents' divorce. I'm a child of divorce, but I'm also the daughter of someone who lives with addiction. My father in the 80s was a very successful diamond dealer. The 84 and 85 Stanley Cup rings, those little diamonds, I've Googled it, the little diamonds, because I was only born in 85. Those little diamonds are from him. He was very successful in appraising jewelry, dealing diamonds, and unfortunately, with the lifestyle and the money, he got into drugs and developed a very severe addiction. I was a daddy's girl, and I spent a lot of time with him, but when I was eight, my parents divorced. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why my dad was always around and then he wasn't. And he couldn't be a father to me. He would commit to come to my birthday party and not show up. He would commit to see me for family time to McDonald's, wouldn't show up. I went from having this dad who was my best friend to experiencing extreme abandonment. Why was my father all of a sudden not interested in being my dad? Why did my dad hate me? As you can imagine, I went through life with a lot of abandonment issues, sadness, depression, anxiety. Um, just want to know here, who here has divorced parents? So some of you understand kind of what it's like to have divorced parents. Now, you don't have to answer this. It's completely private. But, you know, if there is someone out there who has someone close to them that has, you know, been dealing with addiction, you want to, you know, nod your head, that's okay. But some of us know what this is like. It doesn't have to be drugs. It can be addiction. It can, I mean, sorry, it can be alcohol. It can be food. There's all sorts of things you can be addicted to, and it's scary. So I grew up with my dad in and out of my life, not really understanding that he was sick, that he had a mental health um, issue. And I had a lot of anger. I didn't want anything to do with him. I wanted him to die. Like I did not care about my dad. He hurt me so much. And in my 20s, I was given a gift. I was an employee of Lululemon. <laughs> I helped open the store in Winnipeg. I moved to Edmonton when I finished my schooling at public relations and then eventually moved to Vancouver. But during my duration of working for Lululemon, they gave me the gift of going to the Landmark Forum. So does anyone know, has anyone been to the Landmark Forum? So Landmark changed my life. I was living in Edmonton at the time and I saw it as a free trip to Vancouver because I was in my twenties. And who doesn't want a free trip to Vancouver? Am I right? Yeah, I know I'm right because you all live here except for all of you watching, not all of you live here. <laughs> and so I was like, I'll go. I didn't have any expectations. I thought it might be a little fluffy. And at one point during that, those, that session, something clicked. Something just completely resonated with me. And I had a moment where I decided I'm gonna forgive my dad. I'm tired of being upset. I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being sad. I want my dad in my life and I'm willing to accept whatever relationship he's able to give me. And so it was a break. I don't know why I didn't have my cell phone because I'm a millennial, but I didn't. I was like crying at a grocery store down the street from the landmark office in downtown Vancouver. And I walked in, I was like, I need a phone. And they gave me a phone in like a cash register aisle that was not being used, I was bawling my eyes out and tons of people everywhere. It was quite the scene. I luckily remembered my mom's calling card number and I called my dad. I probably dialed like 30 numbers to get there. Does it remember, do you guys remember calling cards? Okay. Anyways, that was, that was quite the thing. I was like, oh gosh calling my dad and he answers and I basically just told him I forgive you and I'm sorry for ever wishing anything bad on you and you're my dad and I love you and I want to accept whatever relationship you can give me. I will accept whatever you can give me dad and we cried and we talked about it and I thought you know what if it's a text every two weeks that's fine I'll accept it but you know what happened my dad began his journey to sobriety my dad developed a relationship with me where we talked almost every day he started a relationship again with his parents, with his siblings. He changed his job. He began to integrate more into society. This was about 10 years ago. All I ever wanted was a dad in my life that loved me like a daughter and cherished me like a daughter. And it wasn't the relationship I imagined, like a Disney movie or you know, Full House like Danny Tanner. It wasn't that relationship that I imagined, but it was perfect because it was what I didn't have and it was a dad in my life. 
and it's knowing that I was loved. And by this time, I'm living now in Vancouver. My dad's in Winnipeg. So I have like a long distance relationship with my dad and I'll never forget my dad decided to come out and visit me. So he drives across the country, which is, <laughs> it's flat most of the way. And uh, I remember having this moment, I'm living downtown Vancouver. It used to be chapters at Sports Check on Robson. I was living above there. And I remember standing on my deck, looking out the window and my dad was on the couch and I was like, there's a complete stranger on my couch. And like, it's a really weird feeling because it's my dad, but he's a stranger. And I remember just sitting and we talked for hours and I learned all about his life. And he told me about his addiction and we got to really know each other. And from that moment on, I knew like it happened. Like I have my dad back in my life. And so we developed this really beautiful relationship. He come, used to come out and visit me a couple times a year. And since I've moved to Pemberton, he's visited a few times too. However, since stopping using drugs, his health has declined. And he has COPD, chronic pulmonary obstructive disorder. And that means he basically can't breathe. <laughs> he is now oxygen dependent and he still has mental health issues due to his addiction, but also with his illness, he doesn't get enough oxygen to the brain. And in December, we were given some news. In December, we were told that he had a year and a half to two years left to live. I finally have my father back in my life and now he's being taken away from me. What am I supposed to do? Well, let me tell you, this year, starting in December, January, has been the hardest year of my life. And I'm gonna tell you a bit more about what's going on in my life and how I've managed to try and keep my head above water and what I'm doing to do so in my personal and professional life. And it's gonna wrap up with the I'm Resilient Project, but the I'm Resilient Project is gonna be kind of woven through. But I believe because I've built up my ability to be resilient, over the years I've been through stuff, but because over the years I've done things for self-care and to take care of myself mentally, and because I've been through stuff, as all of you have, I'm able to be resilient. I'm able to feel my feelings, be really upset, and then come back a better version of myself. And sometimes it takes time. I've had downfalls in my business. My business has just turned 11 years old. I'm 34 years old. I started my business when I first moved to Vancouver at the beginning of recession. I had no idea what I was doing. Like social media just became a thing. I didn't have any business mentors because I wasn't from here. I figured a lot out. I fell in love with networking. Like I went to every BNI chapter. I started a coupon company because I wanted free yoga. That's a whole nother story. Anyways, I figured it all out. I've learned the hard way. I've learned the easy way. And so I'm going to share with you my journey over resilience. My dad is still alive. His health is rapidly declining. I just got back from a trip from Germany. Um, he fell and broke his ribs, which now he can't go to his lung rehab program. And his attitude is so positive. Um, my husband is 43 years old. And last Wednesday, he was brought down here by ambulance from Pemberton, three hours away, because he had a heart attack. We've been at St. Paul's Hospital since Wednesday. This is my, my break. I'm actually really happy to be here because this is something that I needed to do for me and I need to do for you. Um, people are like, how are you dealing with all of this? And I'm gonna share with you how to build up that resilience. And it's not easy, but I could tell you that I've only cried once today and it was on the phone to WestJet because they wouldn't refund me my flight. <laughs> I was supposed to go to Toronto. I just couldn't hold it in. And tears didn't help, I still didn't get a refund. But it felt really good to cry. <laughs> if you hear this WestJet, I'd like my $300 back, please. Um, but this here, this picture that you're looking at is a really special moment. So my dad has always been quite, he's extroverted, but not really open about his story, but he's okay with me being open about sharing his story about addiction and being a daughter of someone who lives with addiction. And he's apologized over the years and I asked for a, a letter. I, over the years, I said, can you just write out apology letter? Like I'm that person who wants to hold on to a note forever. And uh, on January 1st, I woke up to an apology letter from my father. It was really special and it means a lot to me. And this, this right here was because I was invited to be the guest speaker at an AGM in Winnipeg. Jewish Child and Family Services has been a huge support to my dad. Without them, I don't know where my dad would be. I don't know if he'd be in 
in the hospital or even alive because they really provide that support that I can't provide. And they asked me to be a guest speaker to talk about my experience. And when um, CBC found out I was coming to Winnipeg to speak about this and to talk about my I Am Resilient project, they had me and my father on the radio for 20 minutes, Father's Day weekend, to share our journey um, from both of our perspectives. And I have that video up on my website. It, it's a video of a radio of a clip. But it was one of the most special moments I've had because I don't have a lot of positive memories with my dad. I have a lot of memories of my dad not showing up when I needed him. And this was such a special experience for us because we've never done anything like this. We both love talking. <laughs> and it was a really pivotal moment in our journey for resilience. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions? Comments? All right. Well, let's talk about building resilience. If you have a question or comment, and if you're going through stuff, which I know some of you have some stuff keeping you up at night, please, please raise your hand. I want to help you. I'm, and I'm not a therapist. I'm just a professional human who like is very resilient. <laughs> um, I, I did something and I don't know, maybe you can just nod. And if you're at a computer, you can nod along, but do you believe in manifestation? All right. So I was doing goal setting after I found out my dad's diagnosis of like a year and a half to two years left to live, I decided I'm going to pick a word for 2019. And my word was resilient. And I really think the universe listened and they're going to, they said, let's see how resilient you can really be. Like you are going to be tested. And I'm going to give you the Coles nose version of my year. So I found out about my dad, which was like a kick to the gut. My grandfather, who was like my dad, who basically helped raise me, who was 90, started to rapidly decline. So we were at the end of his life. My grandfather then passed away on my husband's birthday. Between me and my husband, we had to spend probably over $3,000 in flights to go back to Winnipeg for the funeral. Around this time, our truck broke, which cost thousands of dollars. We just got it back before going to Winnipeg. On the way home from my trip to Winnipeg, which was 10 days, which was 10 days too long. I did move from there. I love it. I love my friends. I love you, Winnipeg, but I'm a West Coast girl now. On the way home from the airport after a very difficult funeral, you know, Jewish um, tradition in, the, in death is to shiva. You sit and you mourn and you celebrate. It's, it's exhausting and it's beautiful, but I was ready to come back and heal. And on our way home from the airport at Spring Creek on the highway, 80 kilometers an hour zone, got in a car accident, got a concussion and whiplash, which I'm still recovering from. Our truck then had to go, it wasn't drivable. So then we lost the truck for six more weeks. I then had to go to Germany and launch a product, which was a really amazing experience, but I wasn't recovered from the concussion. I took no time off to recover. I couldn't, I could not take time off with the lights just Oh, but not on. And then that was really difficult, not having a day off, really giving it my all in the business world, because that's what I do. I do things at 110% in business, because if I'm passionate and believe in it, it needs everything in me. And I gave it everything I had, but I wasn't giving it to myself. I just started to feel like I was getting back to it. My I Am Resilient project is taking off. Strangers are submitting stories to me, which, again, I'll touch on later. And then my husband suffered a heart attack last week. I am resilient because you know what? I'm alive and he's alive and I'm doing the best I can, right? So I'm going to share with you things that have worked in my personal life and my professional life. And please take away from this what you want. And just know this is what worked for me and some of it may work for you. Some of it may not work for you. But... I think I'm doing all right despite the circumstances, so I think it's, it's, it's worth the try. And I know some of you are going through things. And I just wanna say, welcome back to the market on being single. Hell yeah, the era, yeah, hell yeah. There's a lot of awesome women out there who are gonna be lucky to, I mean, yeah, they're gonna be lucky to meet you. If you're having a business challenge, that's a sign from the universe to make a pivot, make a change. Something's not working for a reason. You know, if you're trying to market a product, you can't figure it out. Maybe tonight's the night you meet a marketer Wink, <laughs> hint, hint. Um, you know, there's, you're all here for a reason. So just remember that this is a silver lining in your, can I swear? There's a silver lining in your shit storm, I promise. So 
I'm starting with this because it's my most favorite thing. Has anyone heard of Sean Acor? Okay, he's a psychologist and he has a book called Discovering, uh, oh, sorry, that's the concussion. Anyways, Google him. One of his, um, he's a psychologist and something that he has proven is that if you practice gratitude every day, so if you look at every day for the past 24 hours, three things that you're grateful for, over 21 days in a row, you are gonna change the neural pathways in your brain to be a happier person. Do you wanna be a happier person? It's a trick question because who doesn't? You know what I mean? You can still be the happiest person in the world and still work on yourself. So three years ago, I was given the gift to go to a luxury wellness retreat in Victoria and I had a bunch of prerequisite reading to do. And this one specific TED video, which is on a, one of my blogs, was given to me and there he talked about the, the practice of gratitude. So what did I do? I opened my phone. I set my phone alarm to go off every day at 9 p.m. And if you're still here at 9 p.m., you'll see it because it's going to go off. <laughs> and it goes off in movie theaters. I'm really annoying, but I won't shut it off because it, if I shut it off, it's, I, I'm out of practice. And it goes off and I list three things I'm grateful for from the past 24 hours. And what's really interesting is I've started, so I share it with my husband if we're together. If I'm in a really bad mood and I'm in one end of the house and my alarm goes off and my husband hears it, and he's in the other room watching hockey, you know, across the house, he'll yell, hockey, cats, and boobies. Like, he, he knows how to make me laugh. He knows what he's grateful for from that day. It could be something as small as the fresh breeze of flowers or your shadow finally appeared because the sun is out or that hot cup of coffee or an email you got or that you dyed your hair or, you know, you never know. Maybe it's a stranger that smiled at you that you needed at that time. So by stopping and focusing on three things from the past 24 hours um, I'm grateful for has helped me in both my business and professional life. Not only has it been helpful, but people notice because I don't just share it with my husband. If I'm at a party, everyone knows it's what I do. We stop what we're doing and all 30 of us will list what we're grateful for. And I know it sounds super cheesy, but like it's really special and it stops you to force it forces you to stop and really think about what you're grateful for. And if you're in a terrible mood, it shows you that your day really wasn't so bad because it's very easy to find three things. And I've started sharing them in my Instagram. So this is where I'm going to drop my Instagram handle. It's Blair from Blairland. B-L-A-I-R. There's no E. Blair from Blairland. And if you guys, you know, want to start sharing your gratitude practice on Instagram like I do, and you want to tag me in it, that's awesome. If you want to follow me and not share anything, also cool. But I started sharing what I'm grateful for, and these are some examples, in my daily practice. And what's really interesting is I know people have noticed it because, for example, you can see the second image there says Advil and Tylenol. So that was right after my concussion. And I ran into a friend who's a physiotherapist who I haven't seen in about a year. I ran into her maybe about a month after my accident. And she was like, how are you feeling? I think you're getting better. I'm like, oh yeah, like how do you know? She's like, oh, you stop putting Advil and Tylenol in your gratitude. <laughs> um, I mean, and it could be anything. It's like this most recent one, or the one on the far right, that was taken my husband's second night in the hospital. We found the best of a bad situation. Like he got upgraded to a private room. Tons of, we got the, a huge outpouring of friends and family, you know, really grateful that it was supposed to rain and it didn't and I really needed sunshine because you know how you feel the difference between sunshine and grayness. So practicing gratitude is really important. And if you're struggling, if you're having a business challenge, and I didn't really put too many of them on, I mean, you can go through my Instagram and see, but if you're having a business challenge, I really encourage you to practice your gratitude and, inc and include something that has to do with your business. You can do more than, like I did four one day, sometimes I do two, but I usually keep it on a three average. And I generally think this is probably one of the biggest reasons I'm able to be so resilient because I can find the silver lining in a shit storm. Before I move on, does anyone have any questions about the practice of gratitude and how it changes, you know, the neural pathways in your brain? So how often do you do it again? Every single day. I do it at 9 p.m. I have a friend out there. She has a nail business, Cheyenne. I'm sure you're going to watch this. She starts her day off with gratitude. She sits down with her coffee and she writes a handwritten list of what she's grateful for for the day. So we do it once. So. Yes, I do. I mean, you can do it as much as you want, but it's, you know, routine, right? You brush your teeth, 
wash your hair, like whatever your routine is. For me, 9 p.m. is good because it's how I wrap my day off, my day up. And sometimes I use it also as like I, I post it to Instagram and then my phone, I'm done with my phone for the day. And I can, but I, it's really hard for me because <laughs> I do social media marketing. Yes. Um, Tony Robbins also talks about this. He calls it uh, priming, you know, like you do it in the first time in the morning. So where you thank a few things like in your life and then you just kind of get ready for the day. Right. So Alex is talking about priming, which is something that Tony Robbins um, suggests. And I'm just repeating for the, the viewers out there. Um, and it's how you set your day up. So that's a great way to do it too. And I know a lot of people who practice first thing. I'm, so, I'm a morning person. I usually wake up pretty positive. Um, for me, it's easier for my day to go downhill than my day to start off down. Um, so I found for me, it's really good to reflect on my day, but you need to do what's best for you. You don't have to share with anyone. I started off by writing it in a journal. Then I started it in my notes section on my phone. Then my husband and I started doing it verbally. You know, I'm not with him tonight, so we're going to text each other what we're grateful for. He's probably going to say he's grateful that he got upgraded to the lounge with the TV, <laughs> the penthouse room, we're calling it. So any other questions about the practice of gratitude? All right. Oh, I, I, not a question, but a comment. I heard that uh, what you were talking about before, how the neurons in your brain think. And he, he, uh, what he said was that because when you're grateful, the brain thinks you're already successful. Right. So Judy just basically, as a summary, said something like when you're practicing gratitude, um, the neural pathways or the neurons in your brain, uh, it tricks them to thinking you're already successful, which you all are all successful. I promise you. But um, it's just something to enhance you and help bring you more success. Is that an okay summary? Okay. Great. Self-care. This is something that a lot of us let slide. Is everyone in here, is almost everyone in here an entrepreneur? Who here has given up going to the gym, going to yoga, going out with friends, brushing their hair, going to the spa, whatever they need to, reading a book because they put their business first? Yes. A lot of people are raising your hands, or only a few, but I'm pretending it's a lot. <laughs> Just one, but I know they're all, everyone's nodding. I've done it. I've had a business for 11 years. No, I'm not going to meet my friends. I got to work on my business. Friends are like the, the spice of life here, people. So... My, my favorite analogy, and I use it time and time again, is that you can't pour from an empty cup. Am I right? If you don't take care of yourself, how can you take care of anyone else? If you don't take care of yourself, how can you do a good job with your business and with your clients? So self-care. There's so many different types of self-care. So personal self-care for me might be different than all of you or all of you. But for me, my routine, specifically since I found out the news about my dad, is well it's not a routine i decided to cut out alcohol i haven't had a drink since january or sorry december 31st or like january 1st really late in the night or early in the morning that's 10 months that's the longest i've gone since i was a teenager <laughs> okay so i cut out alcohol because it it didn't serve me i cut out the things that didn't serve me um i will say no to plans if i'm tired i'm not just going to go and do things so for example public speaking really fills my cup and my husband's in the hospital about to get a bypass surgery, about to get his open heart surgery. We decided for me to keep this because it's what I need to do to take care of myself. This is the type of thing that fuels me. Sitting and being upset and thinking about, <laughs> thinking about what we're going through is not, like it, it makes more sense for me to do things that are gonna inspire others. So other self-care, I get my nails done. I go to the gym. So what I do, I set my alarm every day. I'm up between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. I usually do a bit of personal writing. I'm writing a book. I got good writing time. I work out. I start every day with movement, even if it's 20 minutes and it's a lazy bike ride or a stationary bike. I know that make, makes my mental health better. I know that I can do better work for my clients and I'm more creative if I start each day with movement. I know what I need to drink or eat in the morning, which is water and like a healthy smoothie. And I fill it full of all this goodness. I decided to cut out mostly sugar and dairy. Dairy is really hard because I love cheese. So, so I eat some goat cheese, but I cut out foods that didn't energize me. I eat to fuel my body and I eat to fuel my brain. And I started a program called Fuel for Fat Loss with this really wonderful lady named Simone. But I needed guidance because I'm not a nutritionist and I don't know what the heck I'm doing and I really like snacks. I mean, like candy corn season is here and I haven't had candy corn yet. It's Halloween and I'm very proud of myself. 
but I have stress eat. <laughs> I am stress eating and I did have a tub of cookie dough ice cream. So self-care, right? This is where you have to agree with me because it happens. <laughs> um, self-care for business. The things that you really love to do in business, do more of. So I love networking. I sometimes can easily sit at my desk and not interact with another human. And yes, I have cats, but like you can only spend so much time with your animals because they don't really respond unless you have treats. So if there's something specific you like to do in business, do it, right? Maybe you really like invoicing, or you love emailing, like figure out what it is that you really love that's considered self-care and do it. Like if you like public speaking, do more of it. That's what I'm doing. I love spreading my message about resilience. Oh wait, does anyone have any questions about self-care? You all know what self-care is. You all probably don't do much, as, as enough of it, right? Workout? Working out, yes, working out. Do you work out? Well, I started doing a fitness program. My own. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes, working out is yeah. perfect. And you can do it something like five minutes, 10 minutes. I don't know, I'm not a personal trainer, but I'm sure. There's YouTube videos, but you can do stuff in your living room. It's very easy. There's no excuse for you not to move first thing in the morning. Working out is great. Making connections. This is so important. We are human beings. We need connections. It doesn't mean you need to make 4,000 friends. Maybe you're an introvert and you want to make a couple solid, really good friends at when you're feeling like you have the energy you want to be with them. Maybe you're someone who you don't want to go to a bunch of networking events, but maybe you go to one conference every year and your goal is to meet one new person. Making connections in the per your personal life and your professional life will help you grow and evolve and develop and be happy and be resilient. If you go through something really difficult in your business, but you don't have a business network to support you, how do you know what to do? I go to my other people, I go to other people in my industry and other business owners and other entrepreneurs for advice all the time because there's no specific roadmap to being an entrepreneur. There's no specific roadmap to really anything. I kind of believe that we're all just adults pretending that we all know what we're doing and we're just really good at it. <laughs> I mean, I do know what I'm doing to an extent, but if, especially if you're in the space of innovation, how are you supposed to know what you're gonna, you know, what you're doing unless you connect with other innovators. If you're in the a space of, you know, getting, becoming a public speaker or first time writing a book, how are you supposed to know really what to do? If you connect with other people who are experienced, they can help you. On the non-business side, you know, if you have friends that you've been neglecting for your business, make a plan with them. Go get a personal connection. Stop what you're doing and go feed your soul. Make those connections. Maybe you haven't spoken to a family member in a really long time. Send them a text message. Sometimes the smallest message makes the biggest difference. And if you feel like you need to open up your phone and text someone right now, I will not be offended. You can just tell them Blair made me do it. Does anyone have any questions about making connections? Oh, you do. So, uh, you know, at times uh, when we are making connections, uh, or the, the kind of story that the, the story or own story that we share, so there are a lot of ego-related boundaries standing around us that stops us, like you know, to go out and make those connections. Yes. It takes many other people to come out and make those connections. So how to overcome? So we have a question asking how to overcome boundary, um, overcome insecurities. Not insecurities, I should say that I think it's more of ego. Oh, overcoming ego, over making connections. Um, I think it depends on that situation. I think ego is a very tricky thing to battle. And I recommend if you're someone who maybe you've identified yourself as having a bit of an ego, but you're not. But if you out there maybe are having trouble making connections, Maybe you need, a, you need a therapist to help you. I have two therapists and as of this week, I'll probably have a third. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. And when I'm stuck, I get help. It's not that hard. If you are having trouble making connections, there's nothing wrong with getting help. And there's tons of resources out there that are completely affordable. So I recommend you seeking out those connections. Maybe you're in a self-help group for something. Maybe you're in a book club. It doesn't matter. Find something. Maybe you golf once every three weeks. I think you can pretty much golf in Vancouver all year, right? So like find what you love and make connections within something you love that you don't think the ego is going to get in the way. And if that's still a challenge, get some help. Um, avoid seeing crises as unbeatable problems. My husband's going to come out the other side. He didn't die. 
My husband did not drop dead from a heart attack in the back country. He's an extreme athlete. I know that and I have to tell myself that. And yeah, it's really fucking scary. My dad is also going to die. My dad that I just got back in my life. Life is really hard. Sometimes it's really easy, but you know, in this situation, I, I know it's Shane's going to come out the other side. I know my dad is doing the best to leave his legacy and leave the best life possible and do the best he can with the time he has left. Businesses, have you, has anyone here suffered a business crisis? I have. I've had clients stiff me. When I first started my business, they saw me as a female millennial. What does she know? I've been stiff for tens of thousands of dollars. I've overcome that. I've made a dollar stretch, let me tell you. But I've really learned how to protect my boundaries. But you know what I did during that time? I had a different website that does not, doesn't exist, but I created something called the Daily Emotional Forecast. And it was a free embeddable widget that I had on my website that anyone else could take for free. And every day it was uploaded with a positive saying or quote. And I did it for me. And I knew I'd overcome it. And people put it on their website. And I, my mom and I would text positive things to each other every morning. And it was really shitty because I had a big client stiff me because they took advantage of me. But I was able to see the positives from my daily emotional forecast. This is well before the time of memes. I guess I'm ahead of my time. Imagine where I'd be if I stuck to that, okay? Does anyone have any questions about seeing the silver lining? I'm gonna leave you with knowing that it's there. So when you are in a crappy situation, you will overcome it. I don't promise, but I almost promise. I 99% promise. Been there before. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, I'm in it. Um, except that change is a part of living. People change, businesses change. Think about where you were last year at this time in your business. Think about where you were five years ago at this time in your business. What were you doing for your career 10 years ago? Some of you are still doing the same thing. Some of you were doing something completely different. Maybe you were in a different city or country, maybe part of the world. Alex, were you, where were you 10 years ago? Uh, here in Vancouver. Oh, he was here in Vancouver. 12 years ago, I was in Dubai. Right, 12 years ago, he was in Dubai. I didn't, I should have asked you. You know, 10 years ago, I was living in Vancouver. Just my business was about a year old. I was trying to make ends meet. I was living downtown. Now I'm living in Pemberton. I have a successful communications company and I am a motivational speaker and I'm writing a book. Things change and change will happen. Change is inevitable, right? Personal life, things change. Your mental health shifts and changes. Your body changes. What are you doing to prepare for your next change? Being okay with change is a really important and integral part of being resilient. Knowing that whatever happens next will be okay and that you are in mostly control. And if something happens that you feel like you're out of control of, look at the positive lining and know that that change is happening for a reason. Does anyone have a question about that? All right. So that means everyone understands that change is happening. Change is happening right now. For all I know, something I'm saying is resonating with you and you're gonna go home and make a small, action text someone submit a story to me send me a message and it's going to change the course of whatever was planned without meeting me you never know right set goals and move towards them i am a goal getter i know that sounds really cheesy but i've been using it a lot um so when i started at lululemon in 2005 which was a few years ago um we did goal setting we used you know the bhag theory is this steve covey which is great yeah, changed my life. I've never set goals. Like I love to-do lists. I make to-do lists, I highlight things, and I make to-do lists of my to-do lists that are the highlighted things. Like I love lists, like lists are my favorite, but it's not, a, not goals. It's like, and it's things like if I do something and it's not on the list, I'll write on the list just so I can cross it out. Like I like, so when I discovered goal setting, whew, life changed. Now I know what I wanna do and how I'm gonna get there. Set, and it doesn't have to be big goals, maybe it's just for the day. Today, your goal is to shower. You know, lately, little goals is the biggest, you know, accomplishing them is the biggest thing. For me, it's like this morning, I was like, okay, I'm speaking tonight. Today, I'm going to wash my hair. You can imagine, I don't have a lot of time for myself. My goal was I'm going to get up 10 minutes early and wash my hair. Lucky you. See you. But sometimes I have bigger goals, like 2020. I'm going to do at least two speaking engagements a month. You know, I just did seven in like a five week period, right? Or not, that's a bad example because I don't actually know, but it was something around seven. I can't remember right now and that's the concussion. Um, and I'm okay with that and I'm being honest about it because I'm not perfect. Um, 
but I, I set a goal and I obtained a, a large amount of speaking engagements across the country this summer and this fall. Big goal, little goal. My little goal is to not cry tomorrow. I'm gonna get through tomorrow and not cry. That could actually be also a big goal. I don't know, we'll see how it unfolds. You know, and uh, you know, my goal is to be strong for my husband. My goal is to bring on one more big social media marketing client. And I have a couple proposals out there and I know one of them's gonna land. My goal is to publish a book. My first book, I was gonna have the hard copy in hand by December 31st, but then my grandfather died and then I got a concussion and then my husband had a heart attack. My deadline's changed a little. It's gonna be early next year and it's gonna happen. But you know what, it's my own goal. I'm in control, just like you're in control and you're in control and you out there are in control. So setting goals and move towards them. What are you gonna to do today to make your goals happen? Can I see a nod? Who here sets goals? Great. There's so many goal setting templates online. If you're like, I don't know where to start, you could just Google goal setting template. Lululemon goal setting template. They have stuff out there. Goal setting is so important because it's like wandering around aimlessly in the woods. It's like, I don't know, should I go look at this tree? Should I go to that tree? Like, where should I go? But then if you have goals, you can follow a path to get to that specific golden tree that you're looking for. Who has questions about goal setting? Who's gonna go and set some goals but like for 2020? But you have three months. Three months left of this decade, yes. Set some goals, set some little goals, set some big goals. You know, we're gonna sell out Roger's event because he's gonna have a Facebook event created. We're gonna share it, you know, we're gonna spread the word. Little goals, big goals, they're all goals. Look for opportunities for self-discovery. Keeping your head down in your life, working and personal life and not trying new things won't really help you evolve and grow. So, Landmark Forum, well, I mean, I took that for a free trip to Vancouver, but it changed my life. Like, look, it changed my life, my dad's life, my sister's life, my grandparents' life, my aunt's life, my uncle's life, my dad's, did I say my dad's life? I'll say it again, my dad's life. It's changed all of our lives. Like, where would I be without that one decision to like take a free trip to Vancouver? You know, self-discovery. Now I'm looking for a, a, a yoga retreat in Bali so I can go visit Monica. I wanna go visit Monica, I wanna do some yoga in Bali. I've never been to Bali. I wanna go do something I've never done before. Pottery classes, I moved to Whistler, I signed up for pottery classes. There I met some really cool people. Self-discovery. If you're curious about something, do it. You never know. It could just evolve your personal like, you know, ability and passion. You might meet someone in that pottery class who's going to hire you. I used to volunteer for Ovarian Cancer Canada when I lived in Vancouver. And I did it because I was passionate about it. I lost my aunt to ovarian cancer and I wanted to give back. I was on a committee for an event. And I met someone there who owned a large um, fitness company, clothing company, like large global company. I put their brands on Facebook, all because I was volunteering and giving back because it was something that I knew I had to do. You never know. So if you're not doing something for yourself to evolve, you know, your passions or your skill set, make sure you do it. I love conferences. I love going to marketing conferences. I go to a couple a year if I can. I try to go to somewhere warm or exotic or new, meet new people, grow my network. I love doing that in business. I do that for myself going to things like TED Talks or the Get Inspired Talks, that will probably open you up to a whole new world of possibilities to be inspired to make a pivot or make a change or implement something really different in your life. So if you're not doing anything to evolve, I highly recommend doing something. Stay positive and maintain a hopeful outlook. Well, I don't know how many examples I need to keep giving you, but just know it's gonna be okay. And if you're not feeling okay, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. You know, like sometimes things are hard. Sometimes it's, a, sometimes it's really little, like you stubbed your toe, like that really hurts. Sometimes it's not okay. Sometimes it's not okay when a family member is sick, but you know they're gonna get better most of the time. Yes. It's funny to say staying positive and maintain a hopeful outlook, but sometimes you're just you're having the blues is there some technique you do to get out of the front? Yes, if you're feeling, well, this is my, I'm not a scientist. Going back to my practicing gratitude, if you're in a really terrible mood and you can't get out of it, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you can't see the mountaintop, 
Stop and reflect about the things you're grateful for. What is good in your day? What is good in this moment? Are you sitting on the sky train? You're wet because you forgot your umbrella. Like what you ha you know, you just lost a client. Maybe you, you just, I don't know. You bought like a bunk umbrella that went inside out and you just tripped and fell. Like I fell off the, I fell out of the bus. Okay. I was, I was going down Granville. I had a really important meeting. I was hoping to land a big client. This is years ago when I lived here and I was looking at my phone, getting off the bus, my face planted on Granville. Okay. Ripped my pants on both sides, showed up to a meeting looking not professional, did not get, did not land the client. Not because of that. It was just, I was really like, I felt like, there's no hope. I fell out of a bus, you know? And you know what? I turned that around. I was like, oh my God, I fell out of a bus. That's hilarious. Like, was anyone videotaping that? I was like, that's pretty funny. I was like, you know what? Someone probably laughed at that. I probably made someone chuckle when they needed a chuckle. And you know what? I didn't land that client, but I got a free lunch at Earl's. And that's not a cheap lunch. So when you're in that place and you feel like there's no hope, I really encourage you to try and focus on a few good things from that day or that moment or that week or that month. Does that answer your question? And it's not always that easy. I just have to practice. You have to practice it. It's like you have a muscle, a resilience muscle, right? You want to get a muscle, you work out at the gym, you do some push-ups, some weights. Same with resilience. Practice gratitude. You know, work on yourself. Do things that fuel your passion. Like take up pottery. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. So do you have a question? All right. I didn't have a comment. Judy has a comment. Okay, so in the future when I'm feeling blue, yeah. I will just visualize Slayer planted face down <laughs> on the dress and her her skirt. It was my leggings. I ripped my leggings. leggings. And you're going to a meeting. Yes. So yes. Judy just I um got to break my Judy head. just said when she's feeling blue, she's gonna picture me falling face first out of a bus and ripping my leggings. It was really funny. I mean, I was mortified. I was really mortified. I didn't break my phone. I did not break my phone. Yeah. So, so you know what I mean? Like you want, if you feel like you can't even think about it, think about me falling face first out of a bus on Granville, which for you out there who don't know is very, very busy. It's a very busy um, time of day. So, so Judy, I give you permission to laugh at me. Well, yeah, it depends. You know, with me. Um, so quick recap of those things. Now that's not like, a, it's like the list is endless. These are just what I wanted to share with you with the time given. And these are the things that work for me. Practicing gratitude, self-care, making connections, knowing that you're going to come out of a crisis, accepting change, knowing that change is going to happen, setting goals, look for opportunities for self-discovery, staying positive, did anyone need to take a picture of this? Did anyone at home screenshot it? You can pause it if, if you're watching at home. Okay, I'm gonna change the slides. I just wanna make sure everyone gets this. All right, so you know, you can Google ways to be resilient, ways to be more positive. I'm just giving you real life examples. You know, I've had my business for 11 years. I built my business to be an over five figure a month business at an early age. But I'm still someone who sometimes a client won't pay me or I get a really big bill or my husband goes into the hospital and now I need to support two of us on my income. You never know what's going to happen. But you know that if you do these things and you don't have to do all of them, I know it works for me. Like staying positive right now is hard. It is really hard. But I'm doing the best I can. People keep checking in with me. How are you doing? And my answer is I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to find little slices and little pockets of happiness. Today, I grabbed a coffee and went for a walk down to the seawall. That was nice. Shane had some friends come, his high school buddies. He's in his 40s, so like high school buddies. That was so awesome to see him laughing and, and his friends care so much. You know, look for those little slices of happiness that will really, you know, get you going. So the I Am Resilient Project. I want to use the last 10 minutes of this presentation to talk about the I Am Resilient Project. So going back to the news about my dad, um, I'm just going to have a quick sip of water. Okay. So going back to the news about my father, my dad and I made a decision. We decided that we're going to use our story to help inspire others. Because you know what was happening? I was telling people, I was going for coffee with friends. I was at events telling people about how I had the epiphany to forgive my father. I was given the tools to forgive my dad. 
and told them about the change in the course of life and the story. And I was getting people messaging me, calling me, because of you, I made an appointment with a therapist. I want to fix things with my mom. Because of your story, I'm going to fly across the country and forgive my dad before he passes away. Because of you, I'm actually open to the possibility of forgiveness. Wow. I'm changing people's lives. To me, that's a pretty big deal because I find a way for me to heal is by telling my story. I'm a talker. I was given the gift of the gab. I came into the world blaring. <laughs> that's my favorite thing to say. It's funny because I'm Blair, for those of you who can't remember. Um, <laughs> so I came into the world blaring. Um, and my dad's kind of like that too. And you know what? I said, Dad, like, it's okay if I share, share my story publicly with you, uh, about you. Because every time I tell a story about us, and our journey of forgiveness, the beautiful relationship we formed in that you're now really sick, it's changing people's lives. And so what we decided was the silver lining to our journey isn't that I had a dad who abandoned me and he was an addict and broke my heart. It's that my dad and I reconciled a relationship, developed a beautiful relationship, and that we're using our story to help others forgive and be more resilient and move on and move forward. Because not everyone is so lucky to be able to forgive people in their life or be forgiven, right? And I also think a lot of people go through challenges and they feel alone. I know I felt alone. How is anyone supposed to know what I'm going through? I didn't go to a therapist as a kid. My dad just doesn't want to be with me, so I thought. I didn't know what to do and I was alone and it internalized it. And so now by sharing my story and creating a space creating spaces to, for people to share stories. I'm helping people heal and move on. So what we decided was that we were going to start something called the I Am Resilient Project. Started off as an event. I was like, I'm going to test this out in a, an event. So I had a fundraiser in Whistler. I called it the Path to Resiliency. I invited two other women in the, or two other people who were women in the business community. And we were sharing our stories of resilience, our journeys, because we we're all very connected business women who only see us on the outside as business women. They don't see us having challenges and struggles. And so I had this event sold out like that. We raised a bunch of money and awareness for Whistler Community Services Society, but I created something. I had people coming up to me who I didn't know thanking me for creating the space. Thank you for creating a space for me to come and cry. Thank you for creating a space where I could hear other people's stories so I know I'm not alone. Thank you for doing this. The community needs more things like this. They need a safe space to share. You know, thank you for allowing me to tell my story. I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulder. Whoa. So I decided I was going to create something called the I'm Resilient Project. What is it? What it is, it's an online community right now where we're gathering stories of resilience, gathering stories of people who've overcome challenges. I wanted to create a space where people can share their stories. So it's crowdsourced where you fill out a form online. You tell me about your challenge, how you overcame it and how you were resilient. And those stories are being compiled and published online on the blog and social media. And we'll be, publishing a book next year. So that's not the book I'm working on right now. But my second book is gonna be a coffee table style book with 52 stories of resilience. 52 stories of people who've overcome challenges as a way to help inspire others and help others heal. And we're gonna bookend it with my story and my dad's story. So right now, the I Am Resilient Project exists in uh, online form. It's, it's iamresilient.info. None of our stories are online, but we have a blog where we post a couple blog posts a week. We're going to be starting to share stories next week, so I wanted to make sure I had a stockpile. And what I did was create this space so you can go on there and share your story if you want with your name or anonymously, kind of like Humans of New York meets Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. And if you have no idea what that is, that's okay. But what's happening now is that it's not just my network, but it's people I've never met before who maybe saw someone share something who wanted to share their story to help someone heal, to help themselves heal. And so what I've done is created an online space for people to help them, you know, overcome their challenges and help other people overcome their challenges. And we're going to be doing a series of events and I'm working on that right now, but I like to say it out loud because I believe if I put it in the universe, it'll happen. But if we're working on a portraits of resilience tour, probably hit about five cities in Canada and the U S where we have events where it's, you know, me and another speaker, where we set up, up, you know, set up a station to get portraits and help people tell their stories. Because sometimes people need a little help telling their stories. Am I right? And if you want help telling your stories, I can help you do that. But this for me wasn't created as a job. 
This was created because I needed it. This was created because you needed it and you needed it and maybe you need it and maybe you don't need it and that's okay if you don't. And what's happening is I'm creating a movement of resilience and it's really powerful and really special. And so I don't have an offer to give you today except, well, I do have an offer. I should, I'm taking that back. I have an offer for you today. I don't need your, I'm not trying to sell you anything. The way I make money from this project is that I don't. Um, I get booked to speak and I'm writing a book, but that has nothing to do with this. This has everything to do with those things. So if you have a story you want to share, it could be a, you know, there's no challenge too big or too small, but if you've overcome something, like I can tell you, I probably have 15 stories I'm going to be writing for my own project because I keep, I keep being resilient. And if you have a story that you think will help someone else, or you have a story that you want to share to help yourself heal, or you think you have a story, or you know you have a story that you want to share just because, I invite you to share that story. It's just on the website. It's IamResilient.info. IamResilient.info. There's a submit your story option, and it's a Google form. It's very easy. I always recommend you write it in Word or another software program first because you're only given about 500 words to write your story and a cap out the character um, characters. And what I'm gonna let you guys all know now that we're all connected on LinkedIn, if you're here, like I do offer, like if people want help writing a story, they can like hire me because it does take time. But if you guys have a story you wanna tell and you're in this room tonight, I will help you tell your story. I won't charge you, I want your story to be told. You just need to reach out to me on LinkedIn or get my card and email me and I will help you write your story because I know the importance and the, the power of storytelling. A couple other resources out there besides the I Am Resilient Project, you know, the uh, American Psycho uh, Psychological Association, CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, has been really powerful. Um, really great resource for me for content. Uh, you know, we post a lot on social media, on Twitter and Facebook um and instagram we share a lot of information and stories and positivity it's mental illness awareness week right now if you're and it's okay to not be okay and if you're struggling we are you know we're we want to create a place of positivity and power and education um resource resources for resilience is a great website and also thrive global ariana huffington i think ariana huffington is amazing i love her book thrive i love what she's doing with sleep Sleep is so important. I really try to get, one of my self-care things is I try to get eight hours of sleep. If I know I need to get up a certain time, that means I go to bed at a certain time. I work backwards. If I don't get the sleep I need, I can't, I can't fire on all cylinders, especially healing from a concussion. So with that, I'm gonna go my last slide here while you see if there's any, I got three minutes. So I wanna know if there's any final questions. No, because I shared all the information. Oh, yes. Uh, so I would like to, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the obstacles that you went through in your life. So <clears> what's <throat> the three biggest uh, actionable steps that you took in your life that trans uh, transformed uh, where you were before? So um, Alex wants to know what the three, like three biggest things I did to transform kind of where I was to where Action I've been. Steps, right? Step, yeah. I'm a, it's, I'm a work in progress. I mean, five years ago is different than four years ago. Um, so I guess just to answer that, like, what do I, I think it's about things I practice daily that have really helped me. And like, I don't have time to go too deep into some personal stuff, but I'm someone who survived an abusive relationship. Um, at that point I had to, I was homeless for three weeks, like couch surfing. It was really a dark time. And that's where I made a big change in my life. But changing my lifestyle was a really big one. Prioritizing physical physical health, eating to fuel my body, sleep, really important. Practicing gratitude has probably been the biggest thing for me. That's been about, about three years. Really focusing on the things I'm grateful for, whether it's a small cup of coffee or like landing a huge client or like being invited to speak here. Like I'm really grateful for that. It's probably gonna be in my Instagram story tonight. Um, and also just telling my story, it's been really powerful. So if I'm gonna leave you with anything tonight, and if you're gonna remember one thing, one thing only, I just want you to remember that it's okay to not be okay and that you are resilient. Just remember you're resilient and you're gonna get through it. Thank you. What do I do? The elevator? Oh. You stay up, I can tell. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Larry, you are an icon for resilience. Oh. And I would 
like to, you had eight, right? Yes. So I'd like to offer you a ninth. Yes. This, uh, I won't say it won't be as dramatic as changed my life, but it sure did add a dimension to my life. Every day, I practice three racks. Tell me. A rack is a random act of kindness. Oh, good. Yeah. And I do not go to sleep until I've done my three. I, I bank introductions, so it's easy to get the two done. The third is a bit of a struggle, so I just go to my introduction, and I might introduce Daryl to Judy, because it's in my bank of introductions. That way I get my three done. That's awesome. And I can go to bed at a reasonable time. Well, you're time. such a good person. Well, thank you, but it, it, it's, a, it's a twist on the gratitude. Yeah, well, it's, it's, really and it's also, yeah, I pushed a man in a wheelchair up a hill the other day. <laughs> I met him too. Yeah. <laughs> he was on Mirard and there was a hill. I was like, do you want to push? Yeah. It's a shtick, maybe. Yeah. Claire, thank you yes, so thank much you for on behalf me. of Vancouver Business Network and our friends at Ion Connect. Thank you for making this reproduction possible. Thanks.